Today is Palm Sunday, the day in which Jesus came in. As was prophesied, he would come in on a lowly donkey and a colt. And they celebrated as we sang Hosanna. Uh, Jesus was singing Hosanna and everything else. And then five days later, they went from praising him to cursing him to crucifying him. So don't get too excited when people praise you. <laughs> they may flatter you in your face and be doing this behind your back. I, I heard a, a good one about flattery the other day. Flattery is like chewing gum. Enjoy the taste, but never swallow it. <laughs> Can't do that. So, But when Jesus came in on a donkey and they sang praises, he went into the temple courtyard and Jesus began to prophesy. And he said, you see these stones, these big, huge stones are about the size of this platform. They're huge, some of them. He says, not one will be left on another. And the disciples were shocked. They said, oh my gosh, when will this be? And when will be the sign of your coming? And when will be the end of the age? And Jesus went on and he said, well, some things are going to happen before the sign of the coming of Christ. Number one, there'll be false Christ. False Christ. Number two, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And we've had more wars in the last... 150 years than, you know, they've ever had. And also, he talked about pestilence and sickness, famine, and all these other things. But the main thing he talked about is what I want to continue today in my series, The Rapture of the Church, Part 2. He talked about a nation that would be reborn. And that would be one of the main signs of the coming of Christ. And so if you have a Bible... Uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but before we read that, I want to review last week. We're talking about the sign of the coming of Christ. What are the signs? How close are we to him coming back? Well, we talked last week, I talked about the return of Jesus Christ, and it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself, we're talking about Jesus Christ, he will come, he will descend from heaven with a shout, with a shout. And only the church will hear the shout. There's two phases to the second coming of Christ, and you've got to understand this because a lot of people get confused. They try to push them together. The two phases, he comes first invisibly for the church in the clouds, and then the second phase, seven, uh, second phase, seven years, he comes back visibly. And we're going to talk about that. So the return of Christ, part one, he comes invisibly with a shout. And only those in the church will hear it and will get caught up. The second part, where's my clicker? Hold on here. Thank you. It is supposed to be on. The resurrection of the Christian. So when Christ comes down, it says he'll come down with a shout. And the dead in Christ will rise first. All our loved ones that have known Jesus Christ, they've received the grace of Christ. They walked in the light as he is in the light. And they had fellowship with one another. The dead will rise first. All right? Boom! They'll come up from the graves or from the oceans, or from wherever they are. It doesn't matter where they are. They're going to come up. And, and then let's go, let's read now our text. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4. Allie, you can cut out of this PowerPoint, and we'll go to 1 Thessalonians 4, and we'll read that. So as she's getting that, would you stand with me? And we're going to start at verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. And uh, let's do this. I'll read the odd, and you can read the even verses with me, all right? But concerning brotherly love, you should have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God, or Jesus Christ. He said, love one another, right? To love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. 
But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more in that love. That you also not only increase in love, but aspire to lead a quiet life. To mind your own business. Don't stick your nose in other people's businesses. To work with your own hands as we commanded you. That you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. But I do not want you to be ignorant or unlearned, brethren, concerning those who have died. The Christian word for dying is fallen asleep because we are spirit beings. So we never die, but the body dies. So the body falls asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Next verse. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who are asleep in Jesus. Oh, now my clicker is working. All right. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, if we're still alive, when Jesus comes back invisibly, and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, all right? Don't scare people. Don't spook them. Don't tell them about the latest gossip in Washington or the latest pestilence or the latest variant. Encourage one another. Comfort one another, amen? That's what we're to do. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, help me to teach your word. Help me, Lord, to impart faith that cometh by hearing and hearing by your word, Lord. And Lord, may we be ready. May we listen. May we be convicted, Lord, if we're so busy that we forgot about the whole point of a Christian life. Help us to have an ear to hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. The rapture of the church is what I want to talk to you about now. The rapture is phase one of the second coming of Christ. And when it comes to the rapture, when he will come back invisibly, the Bible says in the last days there will be a lot of mockers. A lot of mockers. In fact, Peter said this, knowing this first, that scoffers or mockers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts, not knowledge, saying, where is the promise of his coming? When's he coming? We've been talking about it for 2,000 years. Give me a break. But Satan knows he's coming. And Satan's make sure that Hollywood keeps putting out all these movies about alien spaceships and all these people that disappear because there's coming a time when one to two billion people will disappear off this planet. And then they're going to have to say, what happened? What happened? A big alien ship came down and took all those non-vaccinated people away. <laughs> Just kidding. Couldn't reject. <laughs> they're going to have some weird stuff like this. And, you know, Christians... Are gonna, we're always looked down at. They don't like us. It's not because of who you are. It's because of who's in you. It's Christ in you. That's why they don't like us. And so the, the word, uh, let's, let's go to the next verse. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And like I said, it could be one to two billion people. Boom, gone, just like that. Then we who are alive will remain, shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, invisibly to meet the Lord in the air. Now, we'll see each other, but no one will see us go. Maybe you've seen some of those old movies about uh, uh, distant thunder and the rapture and some of these other ones, the mark of the beast and the image of the beast kind of 
interesting movies that try to give a depiction of what it's going to be like. But the word rapture is one of the reasons why people criticize the doctrine which we believe in. They say, it's not even in the Bible. No, it's not in the English Bible. Don't be so foolish and ignorant that you think English is the only language of the world. Rapture means to be snatched away violently. It comes from uh, the Greek word harpazo, but it's in the Latin Vulgate. I don't know if you know, but the King James Bible written in English was not the first Bible ever written. Sometimes you have to tell Americans this. King James, or kill me. No, nothing else. Well, there, there was a Hebrew Bible, and then there was a Greek Bible, and there was a Latin Vulgate, which is older than that. In fact, the German Bible is older than the English Bible. And so it's where, in the uh, Latin, it's where raptus, you know, raptus, where we get the English word rap, why some people think there'll be rap music when we get raptured. Oh, you are listening. Oh, okay. Just want to make sure. Raptus. We're going up to be violently snatched away, and it'll be so fast, it'll be in the what? Twinkle of the eye. Twinkling of the eye. It'll be that, ha that, that fast. Now, it's not in the English Bible, but it's in the Latin Vulgate. It's in uh, the... German Bible, it's in, other, it's in the Greek Bible, and like I said, shall be caught up. In the Greek is where we get the English word rapture. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Now, another word for the rapture is called the blessed hope. Anyone ever heard of the blessed hope? Which is totally different than the American term hope. And the American term hope is, I hope mom makes roast beef for dinner. I hope we have banana cream pie for dessert, it's wishful. But hope in the Bible is never wishful thinking. Hope in the Bible is a fact. The blessed hope means the fact of the coming of Christ. You with me? Very important that we understand that. And so let's, let's get into this and let's talk about the point of clarification because some people, you know, they're looking for the Antichrist, they're looking for the Great Tribulation, and they don't really understand the flow of end times events. And so there are two phases to the coming of Christ, the second coming. The first is the rapture when Jesus comes invisibly for his church. For his church. That's it. The second part is seven years after we've been in heaven, he comes back with his church, and every eye will see him. And it's important to enter. So that seven years, when we're in heaven, there'll be the marriage supper, or there'll be the bride, which is us, getting married to Jesus Christ. And then at every wedding, there's usually what? A wedding reception. And there'll be the marriage supper of the Lamb, and you can eat all you want and drink all you want, and you won't get fat, you won't have heartburn, agita, or nothing. Then there's going to be the Bema Seat of Christ, which is the judgment of the Christians for what we did down here in our lifespan for the kingdom of God. Not for ourselves, but for the kingdom of God. And then after that, like... Uh, one of the little children said, we've got to learn how to ride a horse because we're going to come back with Christ at the end of seven years. Now, while we're in heaven, there's going to be called the tribulation and the great tribulation, one world government, mark of the beast, the Antichrist will come. There'll be the United States of Europe, the European Union, and uh, there'll be, um, there's going to be a huge battle at the end called the Battle of Armageddon. And before they destroy the earth, we will come back with Christ on horses. And everyone will see Christ. In fact, here's the scripture for you. Revelation 1-7. Behold, he is coming. This is Jesus. And what? Every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him. Who pierced him? Who killed him? No. The Romans did what? Who wanted? The Jews. The Jews did. 
You don't be too tough on the Italians. We've got a lot of them here. <laughs> it was the Jews who have rejected Jesus Christ and they will finally receive their Messiah when they see him come in the clouds. I mean, who wouldn't, right? <laughs> it's like, but they're going to see the marks and they're going to know who it is. So phase one, he comes back invisibly for the church. Seven years later, phase two, he comes back visibly with the church. And then he's going to set up his kingdom. 1,000 year reign. What is that called? the millennium, and he will destroy some nations. I don't know if the United States will go in the millennium. It could be destroyed. Canada could be destroyed. Mexico could be destroyed. Italy could be destroyed. It's how they act during the Antichrist rule and how they treat other people will decide whether God destroys those nations or lets them go into his kingdom. Are you with me? How many of you know we're Christians first? Americans second. Don't forget that. You don't want to get left behind. We're Christians first. Our citizenship is not here. It's, it's up in heaven. Now, let me give you a few other examples of the second phase of the second coming of Christ. In Jude 1, 14 and 15, they, Jude, uh, Enoch was a guy, how many remember Enoch in the Old Testament? It says, he walked with God and then what? Was no more. Enoch is the Old Testament type of a rapture. Enoch walked with God and boom, disappeared. Who else disappeared from the face of the earth and never died in the Old Testament? Elijah. He's another type of the the rapture. Boom, gone. So it's always in the Bible. But Enoch, before he was raptured, it said, the seventh from Adam, he prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his what? Saints. That's us. And what are we going to do with Jesus? Execute judgment on all. Those who have rejected Christ, those who have mocked and spurned him. And so we're going to come with him and we're going to come back visibly with him. Now, there is no prophecy that has to take place except what is mentioned in Matthew 24. And so in Matthew 24, when the disciples said, Jesus, when will the temple be destroyed? When will these things be? When will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the end of the age? You see, right now we're in the church age. It's also called the times of the Gentiles, when God is saving Gentiles. He's turned his back on the Jews and cut them out of the branch, and he's put the Gentiles into the vine. But there's coming a time when he's going to be done with the Gentiles, and he's going to work again with the Jews to fulfill his promise. And so he says to them, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches have already become tender and puts forth leaves, like in the spring, like right now, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things take place, read Matthew 24 and you'll know what it is. Know that it is near. What is near? The second coming of Christ. Wars, rumors of wars, false Christ, pestilence, famine, all those things. But he also talked about the fig tree which is important for us to know because the fig tree in the Old Testament always represented Israel, the nation of Israel. The vineyard and the fig tree always are types of the nation of Israel. And I can't go into all the teaching. You can listen to last week's sermon, but here's one scripture that has them both. For the prophet Hosea said, For I, the Lord God, found Israel like grapes in the wilderness... And I saw your fathers as the first fruit on the what? And grapes are a part of what? Vineyards. Vineyards. Now, I began to tell you about how to interpret the Bible last week, and a couple people had questions. I confused people, and I just want to re-clarify that. I love it when people ask me questions. I'd rather you ask me questions than uh, 
go around and think that I said something bad. So I want to review to you what I said last week, rules to interpreting the Scripture. Scripture does not mean what you think it means. Scripture does not mean what I say it means. Scripture does not mean something different every time. Scripture means what Scripture means. And the best commentary on the Word of God is the Word of God. And so because of that, there are rules for interpreting Scripture lest we twist it and make it say anything we want. How many ever watched some of those Christian TV programs and heard some of those fancy preachers with, you know, $3,000 suits say thing, and you go, that's in the Bible? That's in the Bible? And they can just twist it. So they come up with, it's called hermeneutics, rules for interpreting scriptures properly. And I want you to get this so we understand what's happening. So the first rule is you interpret the Bible with a literal meaning. And you can interpret probably 70, 60, 70% of the Bible by just reading it. You understand that? It makes sense. And here's the little saying under it. If common sense, while you're reading the Bible, makes sense, seek no other sense. If the Bible says, honor the Lord your God and serve him only, that means you don't serve another God. If the Bible says, honor your mother and father, and it makes sense, you know how to honor. How many know you don't need a deep interpretation? If the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, how many know? It's, thou shalt not commit adultery. How many, thou shalt not kill. How, it's, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's, you know, spouse or donkey or house or whatever. How many know that makes sense? That's called literal interpretation. Common sense. Let me give you a couple other ones. Um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. How many know you really don't need to figure out the symbolism behind love, joy, peace? It's literal. It makes sense. And if you don't know what a word does, you look it up in the literal meaning in the Webster's Dictionary or Bible Commentary or something, okay? So that's the first rule. You interpret with literal meaning. In most of the Bible, you can do that. Now, the second rule is what we call, when you read the Bible, interpret the Bible with a symbolic meaning. If common sense doesn't make sense, then you seek another sense. If you can't understand the literal meaning, then you have to study symbolism, dreams, visions, types, antitypes, shadows, foreshadowings, and all these other things. And so here's an example. You're reading the book of Revelation, and you come across Revelation 12, 1, and it says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Now how many know, what does that mean literally? You know, I've only seen that like in monster movies, you know, when I was a kid, you know, the scary, you know. So you don't, it doesn't make sense literally, right? Common sense doesn't make sense. So you have to seek another sense, which means you've got to study dreams, visions, types, and you look at books like the book of Revelation. How many know the Revelation you can take literally for the first three chapters, and then after that kind of gets a little strange, that's where you have to interpret, not literal, but with symbolism. You have to study symbolism. Daniel, the book of Daniel. I mean, oh, Daniel said some interesting visions and dreams and the bear and the two things and the leopard with wings and the lion and all these other things. It's like, what? Well, it doesn't make sense. You've never literally seen a lion with wings and, and uh, you know, a goat that grew two, three, four horns and they broke off. So, and another one is Zephaniah. Again, a lot of dreams and visions. So you have to look at them different. And when you get into symbolism, you can't just make up what you want. You have to let the Bible decide that a meaning will become the same meaning throughout the Bible unless otherwise stated. And so I was at some family's house uh, recently and uh, I love my family and my, someone in my family said, 
Oh, we heard a preacher on the Bible say every time you, you find a dime on the road, that means the angels of God are working for you. And I said, where is that in the Bible? Well, God told him. Well, hold on here. If you, yeah, I believe God speaks, but if anytime someone speaks, they think it's God, you can get a little weird. I would rather have dollar bills, angels move. Give me dollar bills, I don't want dimes. <laughs> so how many of you know what I'm saying here when there has to be a little bit of order or you can make it say anything you want? Now, when I, I told you my story, when I find, when I'm praying and I find money, that the Lord has told me, that means the, the answer is on the way. That's what it means to me. Uh, and it works, it's, it's worked that way for me. But I can't say it'll work for you. You have to see how God speaks and reveals himself to you. So let's talk a little bit about symbolism because Jesus told most of his teaching in parables, which how many know you can't read them literally? You need a little help to see what it means. And so some people say, well, Pastor, why does God do that? It frustrates me. No, 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 no. God doesn't do anything to frustrate you. If you get frustrated with what God writes, you don't know God. Let me give you a scripture. I'm going to quote it to you. You should look it up. Proverbs 25, 2. It is to the glory of God to conceal a matter, to hide a matter, to put a shadow. It's to the glory of kings to search it out. You with me? God will hide things for you to say, God, I don't know what that means. Help me, God. God goes, oh, me concealing it is drawing you closer to me. Good. And some people go, ah, forget it, I'm done. And they walk away from God, just like they do with Jesus. Jesus, why do you teach in parables? Well, Jesus didn't teach in parables to frustrate the people. He taught in parables to see if they would be drawn in and say, what does that mean? What does that mean? And that's what God does with us. And so when we get into symbolic meanings, we have to find a consistent order, which comes to the third one. When you interpret symbolism, dreams, visions, night visions, trances, angelic visitations, um, foreshadows, signs, whatever they are, there has to be a constant meaning. Once a symbol is given, that meaning stays the same unless Jesus said, it means this. All right? It means this all the time unless someone else says, now it doesn't mean this in what I'm telling you. Then Jesus said to his disciples, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Without understanding the symbols that remain constant with my parables. In Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, Jesus taught a series of parables. And every time Jesus would teach parables, he always started with the exact same parable every time. It's called the parable of the soils. The soils were the, how the sower went out and sowed the seed, remember? Some found on rocky ground, some fell on a little soil, and you know, some fell on good ground and produced 30, 60, 100 fold fruit. And Jesus said, you've got to get the meaning of the types in these parables, or you won't understand any of the parables. And so what were the types in the parable? Well, first of all, the sower goes out and sows the seed. Who was the sower? Jesus. And who's the sower today? You. You are the sower. The seed represents what? The Word, the Gospel, the Word of God. And so when you sow, you share your testimony. I always tell people, when you share a testimony, put the word of God in it somehow. Put it in there. And then it said that it fell on different soils. And I said, the soils, Jesus said, represent different types of people's hearts. Some hearts 
are open to hear the word of God. Some hearts are hard. They don't want to hear it. You heard me say before that when someone hears the gospel three times in Africa, they get saved. In the United States of America, there's such a hardness of heart here. It takes nine times to hear the gospel before someone actually turns and goes, what? Because we're so oversaturated with the gospel that it, it, it makes them callous. Do you know you can come to church and you can hear a message and you can walk out those back doors all excited and blessed and someone beside you can walk out those same doors, hear the same message, angry. The same word that you heard blessed you, the same word the person beside you got them angry. The pastor was talking about me today, I know. I know, every time. He looked at me all the time. I can't walk out with an attitude because of what? The soil, the soil. And then when the soil is hard, Jesus says, and the birds of the air come and they take the seed of the gospel. Now, the birds in Jesus' gospels or in Jesus' parables always represent the devil. I did not say that birds always represent the devil. I said birds represent Satan that comes and snatches away the gospel. This week I was raking and I was raking up all my leaves and I put down some grass seed. And those stupid birds in the backyard, I had to chase them away. They kept coming after and eating all my grass seed. And uh, my wife Loves me feeding the birds, but the birds aren't smart. I just eat the seed, not my grass. But it doesn't mean birds are evil. Someone says, I think pastor said birds are all evil. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying in Jesus' parables, the birds always represent the enemy. Always represent. But they could mean something else. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as... Is that evil? No, not at all. So you see how it can be different. You got to look at the context. My mother, God bless her, she, um, when my dad took a church in Canada, my mother at one time in her life loved owls. Loved owls. Owls all over the place in the house. And, and so we would have people come in, the new pastor, new family, meet them, and all these women start going, oh my gosh, pastor's wife's got, owls are evil. The pastor's wife has evil in the house. They bring that into the church. This is terrible. And so, like it said, ignorant people, sometimes people are ignorant, and instead of asking questions about the owls, they began to spread gossip. Pastor's wife is involved in something evil, has owl. So what did my dad do? He preached the word of God on Genesis 2.31, And God saw all that he made, and indeed, he said it was very good, including the owls. (laughs) Stopped it, just like that, just like that. God loves owls. And just because Jesus is using birds... As the enemy doesn't, you know, how many know there's not a sparrow that doesn't fall that our Father in Heaven does not know about? And so it's, it's, it's good to ask questions. I like when people ask questions, and someone was asking me a question this morning, and I always like that. So let's get back now. We're talking about things in the Bible that mean something constantly unless it's otherwise stated, like the eagle and other things. So we're talking about Israel, and Israel always is referred to as a constant meaning, symbolically, as the fig tree and the vineyard. And Jesus said, the sign of my coming, let's go back to it. Now learn a parable from the fig tree that when the branches already become tender and puts forth leaf, you know Summer is near. How do you know? Because when leaves come out, it's a sign that winter's not going to start. And so you know, when Israel, a fig tree, puts forth its leaves, it's a sign that Jesus is going to come back. When did Israel become a nation? 1948. Did Israel sprout its leaves as a fig tree? Yes. When? 1948. Anyone know? May 4th? 
May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation. No nation in the history of the world has been destroyed and reborn. None, except Israel. Did you know that? And Jesus prophesied it. He said it was going to happen. And when that happens, it's the beginning of the end of the church age. God is going to wind down, stop working with the Gentiles, and he's going to fulfill the rest of the promises to Israel. A lot of people say, oh no, ch the church of Jesus Christ is now Israel. No we're, no, we're not. We're not Israel. If we were Israel, we should all be going over to Israel and buying land. <laughs> we're not Israel. There are promises that the, God the Father made to Israel that he has not yet fulfilled. And he will fulfill them. Now we are the spiritual seed of Abraham by faith. And we can be the spiritual seed of Israel by faith, but we are not physical Israel. Two different things. When we get to heaven, there'll be Israel and there'll be the church. And we'll be married to Jesus. It's going to be wonderful. Now let's talk about the last. The reunion of Christians and families. If you were like me, uh, you may have been blessed with a wonderful godly heritage. Maybe some of you are first generational Christians. God bless you. You're the one that had to plow and push and, and plant seed, and it's your children. If you honor the Lord right, it's your children, your grandchildren that will get the blessing. Well, I'm a grandchild of both sides of my family, Christopher's and the Heights, that they serve the Lord, and I have an amazing heritage. I am here today, not because of me, but because of the great grace of God that came through my grandparents, down to their kids, down to me and my other siblings. It's important you understand that. Uh, the Lord has given me dreams. Of, I've had angelic visitations, and one time my grandmother, she opened this big book to me, and she said, see this? This book? This is your heritage. This is yours, and it's your brothers and your sister. Don't squander it. It was amazing. Big book. Huge book, and it's just amazing. I am so blessed, so blessed, but I, I miss my grandma and grandpa, both sides. I miss some of my aunts and uncles. And when we go up in phase one of the rapture, we're going to see them. We're going to see them. It's going to be wonderful. Now, I'm in my seventh year pastoring Evangelical Christian Church of Waterbury, and I'm not going to remember all the names, so don't get mad at me if I don't mention someone, but you're going to see again Dina Capuano. You're going to see... Ami uh, Lucia Capuano, Vito Tacardi, Amelia De Lucia, some of these sweet saints from this church that recently have fallen asleep in their physical bodies. But we're going to see them again. And it's going to be wonderful. Nothing like that. I don't know if you like reunions. I love reunions. And uh, it's kind of like Christmas and Easter and Mother's Day and you know, 4th of July and, and all these different, I, I just love them. And that's why Jesus says, listen, you need to be careful living in this world. It, it doesn't matter if you have a lot of money or a little money. It doesn't matter if you have houses or not. It doesn't matter if you've got nice cars or it doesn't. What matters is that you keep sure your heart is ready and you don't get clogged down with the things of this world when Jesus Christ comes back, lest you be left behind. Because the only way people are going to get saved when the church is gone, is with their lives. To live for Christ. Do you know how hard it was? When, with the vaccination and how people treated other people with the vaccination, that's nothing to what it's going to be like when the church is gone and people refuse to get the mark of the beast. And if you don't get the mark of the beast, they're going to kill you. Like, you know what they're trying to tell us? You can't meet with your family and neighbors. We want you to tell on your neighbors if they're not vaccinated. And we want you to tell your parents. Do you know the Bible says in the last days, that's what they're going to do with people who don't have the mark of the beast. It's just a preview. You can't stop it. You just have to make sure, as Proverbs 4 says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. And so one last scripture and we'll wrap it up here. Beloved, 
Now, we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be in our new bodies, our new bodies. You're going you're to look like who you are now, but it's going to be a little different. But we know that when he, Jesus, is revealed, invisible, first phase, the rapture, we shall what? We will have our new bodies like Jesus. And that's why a lot of people think we'll be like 33, 33 and a half years old. We're going to be just like him. For we shall see him in the clouds as he is. Now here's what you need to know to keep your heart ready. Everyone who has this hope in him, where do you have it? In your heart. Everyone that has this hope in him, we're going to see our families again. We're going to see Jesus again. We're going to see our loved ones again. Uh, Purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. It's wonderful. It's coming. Nothing has to be done before Christ comes and raptures us. It could happen before I'm done preaching. Do you know that? There's no more signs. There's no more signs. There's signs of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and the tribulation in Israel, but there's no more signs that have to take place for the church to be raptured to heaven. And you say, well, what do we do? Well, you keep living. You keep, like I read today, mind your own business, work with your hands, share with one another, love and increase in love towards one another, And stop being a fear monger, spreading fear. Comfort one another while we wait for Jesus Christ to come. Amen? That's what we know. You know, I think a lot of Christians have been disappointed in in, uh, the last couple years and what they've done. They haven't been encouraging one another. They've been pointing fingers and hollering. and, And I'm not talking about the pandemic. I'm talking about you know, from President Trump to President Biden and and how that's caused a little bit of a civil rift in the church. And how disgraceful for the church to be infighting, infighting. And yet the Bible says, keep a good testimony for those who are outside. Don't fight. Don't do that. Grow in love. What else should we do? Well, remember, we're going to heaven. And you decide on earth how you will enjoy heaven. I often talk about the four T's. It's how we're going to be rewarded in heaven. What do you do with your time? Do you invest some of your time into the kingdom of God? You don't have to invest all your time in the kingdom of God. But how you invest your time, whether it's praying, reading the Bible, whether it's coming here, uh, whether it's fasting, whether it's going on a missions trip, or when you invest your time for the kingdom, God is going to reward you for that greatly in eternity. Number two, not only your time is your talents. Every one of us has different talents. And some can sing, and some can usher, and some can greet, and some can, uh, you know, like our Sunday school teachers, and others are in food pantry. Some can play instruments, and those are God-given talents that he gives us. Some are really good with numbers and administrative and leadership, and some are like behind-the-scenes people. I don't want to be on the platform. I'm behind the scenes, and yet they do so much for the church. Those are your talents. And when you use them for Christ, he says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with few things in the church. I'm going to make you trustworthy over much. Because you used your gifts down here, I'm going to bless you. And then the third thing is your treasures. The money that God gives you. When you invest, you know, Claire did a a great uh, little teaching about how we are not only to support the church, but we're to support missions around the world. And how we use our money. You know, some people get all upset when you talk about treasures. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. And if you give to the church, your treasure is the church, and you will be greatly rewarded in heaven. If you don't give a cent, that's fine. God don't need it. It's for your benefit and no one else's. It's for your benefit. And so there's a lot of people in this church that give their lot of time 
There's a lot of people in the church that use their talents. There's a lot of people that give financially all the time. They give to the church. They, they give to the missions. They, they give benevolence. Sometimes they give to the food pantry. And uh, sometimes people bless people through others. And it's a wonderful testimony. You will be rewarded on that. And then the last T I want to tell you about, and probably the most important T, is called your testimony. Your testimony of what you've done with your mouth while you lived on this planet. And whether you used it, Jesus says, He who confesses me before men, I will confess that person before my Father. But if you can't even open your mouth and confess me before men, I'm not going to confess you before my Father in heaven. What you say with it. And from time to time, we have people come up and give testimonies. And it's always good whether someone's delivered from drugs or maybe they're healed or maybe they just got saved or when some people is water baptized. Your testimony is so important. It's more powerful than your treasures, your time, and your talents. In fact, it says in Revelation 12 that they overcame the devil by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. That's, that's you know, those two things. You think of blood of Jesus, you think of this. And you think of your testimony like this. But the scripture says this. They overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Your testimony. And so let me compliment you as I close today. Evangelical Christian Church of Waterbury is doing a great job. You're doing a great job with your testimony. You're doing a great job with your treasures. You're doing a great job with using your talents and you're doing a great job with your time. Keep doing that. Don't get so caught up in the things of the world. Someone said this, don't be so busy doing stuff that you forget about the main things. For the Lord is coming back. And he's coming back soon. He's coming back soon. I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this, in Thessalonians it says, God did not appoint the church unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are not going to go through the great tribulation, but we may get pinched a little bit with the wickedness going on in our nation. And that's why men also always pray and not lose heart. Did you hear the latest that California did? They passed a law that you can abort a child seven days after its birth now. I'm sorry, you can abort a fetus seven days after the birth. That's our nation. And you don't think Christ is at the door? Now it's, it's got to pass, pass through the Senate, and if it gets through the Senate, you know the governor will sign it. You want to hear another one that California did? They passed a law that there would always be a homosexual, lesbian, transgender, or bisexual on every major business in California on the board. Did you know that? It passed. And the courts laughed at it and shot it down, said it goes against their constitutional rights. You can't force a homosexual, lesbian, transgender, or bisexual. This is our nation. This is, this is what's going on. And I hate to tell you this, but as goes California, guess what? It's coming through. So let's keep doing what we're doing. This is not a message to put any guilt. We're, let's, let's invite, like Roger said, let's, let's get people here at church. Let's get people here at Easter. Let's be ready because he's coming soon. And uh, he could come before you're done lunch today. You just don't know. Amen. Amen. Stand up with me, would you? Amen. He's coming. Amen. Someone asked me, Pastor, there's not any sign that we know about the rapture? And I said, yes, there is, but no one knows it. When the last Gentile soul is saved that God wants saved, boom! Boom! The rapture will happen. I don't know when it will be, but it could be today. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're excited. (laughs) Lord, the world may think 
It's getting more liberal and righteous, but we know it's getting more evil and lawless. And Father, we thank you that you're going to come through Jesus Christ and take over the kingdoms of this world. We pray, Lord God, that we would be ready. Let our hearts not be hardened. Let us, Lord God, look into our hearts with our testimonies and treasures and our times and talents. And Lord, help us to examine ourselves. Help us to judge ourselves so that we would not be hardened when others point fingers. And Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching from the Word of God. My name is Paul Height. I'm the pastor of Evangelical Christian Church, located at 1325 Watertown Ave in Waterbury, Connecticut. We would love to have you join us and worship Jesus Christ this coming Sunday at 1030. Now may God bless you, and may he continue to cause you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of his Son, Jesus Christ.